Welcome to Ask Kalefi, the podcast that dives into real-life problems that plumbing and HVAC technicians face in the field. We're your hosts from the Kalefi Tech Support Team. I'm Greg Tubbs. And I'm Dan Furkus. Welcome. We look forward to sharing some stories from our tech calls and using our background and expertise to make your days a little easier. Hey there, welcome back. Here we are, uh, returning guest, Max Rohr. Yeah, thanks for coming back, Max. Yeah, absolutely. So today we're going to talk about more so on the fitting side of, of, of PEX piping, the common fitting types, and we'll get into a few other little side topics along with that. Yeah, it was great having you on last time when we talked about the different types of PEX that's out there and kind of the application. So we're looking forward to getting a little deeper into, you know, how do you tie that system together and what do you do with it after you get that PEX installed? Sure. So yeah, we can kind of take it from, you know, the PEX is in and now I need to hook it up to something. How do I do it? So um, if we're talking about a PEX A pipe, you can expand that because we talked about in the last episode that with the the way that you extrude PEX A pipe, it allows you to uh, cold expand it up and over the barb of a fitting uh, to repair a kink, things like that. So the way to do that with the PEX A, uh, one is an F1960 uh, fitting designation. So that's going to be on the fitting. And that's, uh, you know, Upanor has been doing that forever. That's uh, a fitting that they brought to market a long time ago with that single barb that you uh, expand with the, the ring. And then it comes back down just the memory of the pipe forms the seal. And then another one that's on the market is a compression sleeve style. So this is something that uh, Rayow and uh, others, there are some other uh, generics now versions of that have done in the radiant heating market for a long time that you've got a brass or a polymer compression sleeve that you actually pull with this specialized tool up and over a barb that forms the seal immediately there too. So those are kind of the uh, PEX A specific uh, style. And then anything, A, B, or C, PEX A, B, or C, can be crimped onto, like we offer an F1807 fitting system. So this is just a standard metal crimp ring over a barb, simple, available everywhere. Uh, it goes on the inside diameter of the pipe. There's no expansion involved. It just slides right in there. Uh, so you've got a bunch of different options there. And then if you come across the job site, you can't find any information about the pipe. You don't know what it is. When in doubt, use that crimp fitting and not the cold expansion so you don't uh, develop a crack or something like that in a pipe that wasn't meant to be expanded. Right, because you can use that that fitting with the crimp ring on any of the PEX A, B, or C pipe. It's just the expansion that you have to use with the A. Um, what I always liked about the expansion fittings is you kind of maintain that same inside diameter. You're not really creating any any type of restriction in the, not, you don't really create a restriction, but you're not narrowing the diameter of that pipe at all. Yeah. It's a good point that any fitting regardless for PEX is going to have a little bit of a flow penalty compared to just the straight length of PEX. So even uh, the PEX A style fitting that you have to expand the pipe over it, uh, you can look down the center of it and it looks like it's about the same diameter, but just a little bit of turbulence of the lip of the fitting will give you a little bit of a flow penalty there. But um, it is it is helpful to have that nice clear flow pattern through there, and um, it, they do that on purpose, so it's a you know, much better flow characteristic than uh, the uh, B and C crimp uh, fittings go on the inside diameter. So you're taking the, the small diameter of the pecs and going smaller to go into the fitting. It would take a bunch of these fittings to make a realistic difference in a radiant heating system or something like that. It's actually probably a bigger deal for plumbing. Uh, that you could have the furthest fixture away from the mechanical room uh, be a little bit, uh, have more of that flow penalty. But with the radiant system, either one is going to be fine, uh, but those are kind of the differences and definitely crimp if, you, if you're not sure. Right. Well, and the advantage with our products is we make tail pieces that are PEX expansion or PEX crimp. Right. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a hydronic or plumbing application with any of our products, almost almost all of our products, we have that PEX option to be able to, to work with either, either any type of PEX. Yeah, we did that for a reason. So you could, you know, you could mix and match fittings, or if you're, you're just, all you're doing is PEX, then you got something to connect on both ends. Right, right. Yeah, we've got a lot yeah, of options. 
one way to do that if you wanted to is you could buy, let's say it's a pressure reducing valve, you could buy one with uh, press tail pieces and another with the type of PEX, the cold expansion tail pieces that you want. And you can mix and match those. So you could have two houses right next door to each other, two different job sites. You start with the press and then on the other side of the PRV, you're moving to PEX, you know, if your jurisdiction allows it or whatever. Uh, and then that's your transition piece. Instead of buying a separate expensive press to PEX connection from one of the, the PEX people, you can just do it right at the valve, which is uh, a nice feature to be able to mix and match like that. Right. And I know we talked a lot about the radiant heating side with PEX, but boy, we see a lot of PEX used on the plumbing side as well. And um, even on the plumbing side, you have the the three types, the PEX A, B, and C, but there you might not have that oxygen barrier. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, um, you could, in some cases, it, you know, an oxygen barrier pipe will be qualified for a plumbing application, but it's going to be more expensive. So usually with plumbing pipes, they're not looking to keep the oxygen out because you're getting oxygenated water from the utility. Um, what you're doing is, in some cases, just looking for better UV protection because it might be exposed to sun for longer. If you're framing a building or something, it might be in sunlight uh, longer than it would be if you just poured concrete on top of it. So different co-extrusion in some cases, different outer jacket to the pipe to give it uh, more uh, sun protection uh, specialties instead of oxygen barrier specialties. Okay, interesting. I guess I didn't even think about that. The UV barrier with plumbing pipe would be more important because it is going to be more exposed. Absolutely. Yeah. So depending on how the different trades line up and when it's you know completely covered, could be a much longer time frame than you would shoot for with uh, with radiant. So getting back to radiant. Getting now. back to radiant. <laughs> now that we jumped on the right. hole. Sorry. <laughs> no. Nope. Took, took us off topic yeah, a little no, bit. No, that's okay. That's what this is all about. You got to get off topic once in a while. Manifolds. I mean, we get a lot of questions about manifolds because that's we make a high quality brass manifold that this PEX ties into. PEX A. Yeah. Any of it. Any of it. Location of the manifold. I think that's probably one of the the more simplistic questions that we get. But I mean, our manifolds are designed to be inverted. They can be installed most any place, but definitely have to be installed inside, indoors. Or in an enclosure. Yeah, we're near near where the PEX terminates, either whether it's coming out of a concrete floor or out of a ceiling. Right. So I guess, you know, you, that's probably one of the advantages. We talked about the, you know, how flexible a radiant heating system is, you know, or how you can customize that system to fit your application. I mean, I, I've seen manifolds located almost anywhere in a home. Yeah, and they're not always the most service friendly, are they? Well, they, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> they can be if you if you think about it right up front. Right. So I mean, it's nice if you have the ability to keep that thing at service height. Now everybody's height is different, right? Mm-hmm. But maybe if we keep it three or four feet off the floor, up in a cabinet, or just on the wall in the mechanical room, I, I think that's probably best. So you're not having to. You also have more wiggle room there, right? You know, but you know, the, you, you you're right. But you also think about the flexibility of a radiant system. I mean, I've seen them in second floor closets, and the advantage to that is you can terminate your pecs up into that closet. You can mount your manifold and just run two pecs feeders up to that. Sure, up to that manifold. So it kind of allows you to customize that to fit almost any application. I mean, Max, yeah, you've probably seen them too. anywhere. All over the place. I think that um, from a troubleshooting standpoint, uh, the best way to do it is to get a bucket and sit on it in the mechanical room and then mount it our feet off the ground so it's right in front of your hands. And so you can do all the balancing and everything's right in front of you. Everything's in the mechanical room. However, let's say you're working on a huge house that is you know 10,000 square feet or something like that. If you put all the manifolds in the mechanical room, then you have what they call a lot of tails. Um, so that's pipe that it takes to just get to the zone that you're going to be heating that you have to route through the house somewhere. And if you do that in uh, a way that you have all of the zones coming back to the manifold that's in the mechanical room in a you know, huge house, you can have a hallway that's always hot. 
that wherever all those tails are coming back to the mechanical room, if one zone is on in the house, the hallway is getting warm. So you can kind of overheat that hallway where what you suggested, where you just take a slightly bigger, maybe three quarter or one inch supply line, just to supply and return through the house to a remote manifold. And then you can break off of that and do all the you know, half inch zones from there. That can be a really good way to go too. So no perfect way to do it. Every set of plans is going to be different. But one of the main recommendations, if you're going to put a manifold in, make sure that it's a couple feet. You know, we like to see four feet off of the ground just so you can navigate those pipes into it well. And if you did have an issue that you could cut it and move it down and, and go on from there. I've seen some manifolds that are you know, two inches off of the concrete and it's going to make a very uh, hard connection time <laughs> for yourself. So that's a good uh, planning piece. Just imagine something going wrong. <laughs> you need to do something with that PEX and you only have yeah. two inches off the floor. It's whether you're kind of in trouble. You got to replace it. Yeah, it's, it's bad news. Or you get a connector that maybe didn't make a good connection and it's leaking. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of tough to to work on when it's that low. Yeah, but boy, you you talked about the flexibility. You know, being able to locate that manifold, you know, away from the mechanical room. You think about trying to lay the packs for that master bedroom zone in that 10,000 square foot house and trying to get those tails back to the mechanical room it's almost impossible i mean you you lose so much of your of your circuit length just getting those feeders back to the back to the manifold that if you know you throw in that manifold in that zone or closer to that zone and running two feeders just saved you a lot of packs to feed yeah, or not to uh, feed there we go yeah <laughs> And basically, if you're working with a designer with one of the text companies, put the manifold uh, wherever you said that you were going to put it, <laughs> or else <laughs> yeah. it throws off the whole design. So if you if you were going to put the manifold right in the center of the warehouse on the north wall, and then uh, you install it in the you know southeast corner, uh, it's going to throw off all those different loop lengths and things like that, and maybe harder to balance back out to where you want it to go. Uh, so find a location and then, then stick with it or, uh, you're going to have to buy your PEX designer, uh, a sandwich and apologize <laughs> if you have to move it around a few times. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's going to make balancing a lot more difficult. But with our manifolds, you can balance it out. So, I mean, it may be something that if it's, it's, it's an eight port manifold and you have seven that are exactly, you know, 333 foot long lengths. And the last one is only a hundred to wrap up that building. You can balance that all out with our manifold, which is nice, but it's not a, you know, it's not like you have to throttle a ball valve or do something weird to get those, those different loops to get the same flow rate. Sure. Yeah. That is one of the advantages with our manifold. You can balance both on the supply and return side of that manifold. So, I mean, you can really dial that that flow in and get it balanced nicely. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of fittings to attach to our manifolds too. Yes. Great way to segue into the next bullet point here. <laughs> <laughs> we always get more about that. Yeah, let's, let's talk about let's that. Let's talk more about that, Greg. How, how many phone calls do we get about, you know, can I use your, your manifold with PEX 1, 2, 3, A, B, C, D? The, the question is always from us. What is the ASTM rating on it? Right. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Make sure that's compatible with our fittings. Right. It's got to be 876. And then you get the question, well, it says 876 slash 877. Will it work? Yeah. Answer is yes. Yeah. Meets that that ASTM rating. Yeah, and that F877 is going to be a fitting standard. So that's usually an umbrella standard for kind of the performance characteristics for a fitting. So a fitting may be listed to F877 plus a dimensional standard like an F1960. So F1960 also has qualified for F877. Um, It just says that it has to be this specific shape. So uh, not all fittings have a dimensional standard like an 1807 or a 1960. Uh, as long as you have F877, it's compatible to to use with that F876 type to get really into the weeds. Uh, but that just means that it, it's up to the job of a you know, radiant uh, a plumbing application that it's, it's going to hold up to the pressures we're expecting there. Right. So as long as your pipe meets those standards... Um, our fittings, you know, we have fittings to go all the way from, I believe it's three eighths all the way up to three quarter, you know, to attach that PEX to our manifold. And 
those fittings are going to fit inside the pecs. It's not a pex expansion fitting at the manifold. It is actually going to go inside the pecs and has a collar that slides over and compression fit to, to tighten it together. That's right. We got that. We call it the olive. Olive. The olive. Yep. And it's a nice fit. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, they'll grab at any of those pecs and, and tighten that right up. Let me get the question about Pexel Pex. Will our product work with Pexel Pex? We do have a fitting system for that. So we offer that, that 682 fitting. And as a standard uh, ASTM 1281. Yeah, it's going to be our PEX L PEX fitting. It's going to work with the Aluma PEX. Right. Max, what's the benefit to using PEX L PEX over standard PEX? So some of the things that, um, like when my dad was doing systems that he liked about the PEX L PEX is it does have some more memory. So especially like near boiler piping, you can make that look really nice and even, even use the copper bender uh, to make the, the sweeps instead of using fitting. So it's a lot uh, easier to wrestle with it because it will stay in a shape uh, compared to the uh, A, B, and C pecs that want to kind of come back to you know wherever they have been sitting for a long time. Or if you use a, a heat gun, you can get an A to straighten out a little bit, but a little bit easier to, to wrangle. Sure. Right. Well, and I've seen with your standard A, B, or C pecs, as it heats up, it'll really start to move. It'll start to change shape where the the PEX LPEX will tend to hold that better. Yeah, that linear expansion, yeah, it uh, just doesn't move around quite as much um, with that metallic layer sandwiched between the, the two polymer layers. Right. The only time I think I ever remember using PEX LPEX in the field was with wood boiler applications. Did yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah, we would insulate it and, and bury it and then run it through the basement wall and uh, – and then hook up to it from there. And then one of the things that uh, Kalefi offers that I think is really helpful is a wrench to get to that manifold connection. So when you've got uh, our system and our manifold, we have that specific wrench that allows you to get in between those ports because the idea is to make the manifold as uh, you know narrow as possible so it's not 10 feet wide, dug up 10 different loops of pipe. Do you guys want to talk about some of the recommendations with that? The, the wrench or the mounting bracket or any of that install stuff that you probably get phone calls for? Yeah. I mean, we, we do get questions about, you know, is there a special wrench? Do you offer one? And you, you just alluded to it that, yeah, we, we have a special wrench. It helps you get in, in between the ports a lot easier than using like a, a, an adjustable wrench. Like most of us have in our tackle or tackle box. <laughs> Greg's still thinking about fishing. Clearly. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Man, here we yeah, go. no, it, it's nice in those tighter applications that you can get in there and, and get it tightened up and make sure you're not going to have a leak. It's easier than getting a channel ox or adjustable in there. How tight is too tight? What do you guys recommend for that? I don't know if I've ever had that question, to be quite honest with you. Most of the guys, <laughs> it's it's funny you ask that because I, I don't think I've ever had. You that. don't have to over tight. It doesn't take much to torque that down. No. You know, the O-ring is what yeah. does the sealing. And that's, uh, I think, a, a good thing to stress, too, that this isn't an NPT connection that you can just, you know, go a full additional rotation or something like that. <laughs> that as soon as you start to feel some resistance, you know, I don't know, a quarter turn past that or something like that, and then check for a week. But there's no, again, no bonus points for, for crushing that O-ring in there to the point that it doesn't work anymore. Right. No, and... I don't think I've ever had, I think I've had one person call with, with a fitting leak and it, I think it was because they either over tightened it or they were missing the O-ring altogether. That fitting is chamfered. So the inside of the manifold's got a chamfer in it. The fitting itself has a chamfer on it to hold that, that O-ring. And once it gets in there, it kind of fills the void. I don't want to say it's difficult to crush that. I mean, you'd have to be really reefing on it pretty hard to, to crush that O-ring in there. <laughs> Right. Yeah. The key is just don't, don't over tighten it. I remember that from being in the field, you take it up, you'll hand tighten, just torque it. You don't have to really get in there and crush it down. No. So you guys probably get a lot of troubleshooting stories and you know, what are some of the, the weird cases that have come up that you've helped customers work through with manifolds? I think one of the biggest ones is upon install. Uh, how do I pressure test this this manifold of yours? If it's a 663 or 668 S1, they all have the air vents on them. So they'll go and pressurize it with air, and then immediately it's leaking out of, of the air vent. Right. So then we get the phone call, hey, what do I do? You know, can I just pull this? Well, you can, but 
hey, we sent a goodie bag with these little black caps in there. The bummer is, is half the time the caps get thrown away on the job. So we do offer replacement caps for that. Yeah, but you will, with every manifold, you will get a set of black caps that you can remove that hygroscopic cap off the top of the air vent. You can screw that black cap on for pressure testing. So those those do come with our manifolds. Um, one question I get a lot is about zoning using a manifold. Yeah. A lot of contractors are out there will you know, install packs for maybe a master bedroom and bathroom, and then the customer comes back and they want to zone the two in, independently. And if you have your PEC set up properly, um, we have thermoelectric actuators that you can put onto our manifolds that allow you to separate the different circuits on the manifold into a zone. So, sure. I mean, you could zone every circuit. I mean, it might be getting a little tough with, with flow requirements, but, you know, say you have a an area split up and you want to take, you know, two or three of the circuits are maybe for the kitchen and, you know, four of the circuits are for the living room, you could separate those with thermoelectric actuators and thermostats to be able to do zoning right through the manifold. Right. And it'll work great with uh, almost any zone panel, but we'd like to tell you to use our ZVR panel if necessary. And that's a a good one too. That is kind of a a conceptual question is how small is too small for an independent zone. So every once in a while, someone will want to do just a, you know, a radiator towel warmer, in a bathroom on its own separate zone. Um, so the, you know, from a flow standpoint, it's not really an issue. We're going to be able to open and close that actuator. Like we're not the problem there. One of the things I would recommend is that you see what the smallest turn down, uh, your boiler, if you're using a boiler, whatever equipment you're using is going to be. So if you've got a boiler, that's only going to turn down to 10,000 BTUs per hour, uh, and you've got a 500 BTU, towel warmer know that that could short short cycle your boiler all year if that's turned up pretty warm right so that's one thing um to be careful of some people will add a little buffer tank so the you know towel warmer can sip off of that instead of firing the boiler every time uh but something that's a, a good practice is just see you know, is that going to be way smaller than the you know the smallest uh fire rate that my boiler is going to be able to stay on for for more than 15 minutes and if so you might lobby to keep the master bedroom and the master bathroom on the same circuit. But uh, from the manifold side, you can mix and match however you want there. Right. Yeah, you have the capability, but you're right. You you always want to take into account what that minimum turndown ratio is of your boiler so that you protect that boiler from short cycling or take or take precautions. Like you said, with the buffer tank, that's a good option to to protect that small zone or protect the boiler in that small zone application. Right. I think another good question that we get a lot is, Hey, I have this manifold installed, everything pressure tested out fine. We're running the system through its paces. And I got one zone that just is not heating. There's no flow through it. What do I have to do? Sounds like you need to do a little purging probably. You got it. You got it. <laughs> probably got yeah. some air bound up in that, in that manifold or in that, in that pack circuit. Sometimes the guy will even kind of fire back and go, well, you know, I went through and purged this whole system. You know, I, I don't know how that can be. There's got to be something stuck. Well, if there is something stuck, what's nice about our manifold is you can remove on the supply and the return, you can remove both cartridges, the isolation shutoff and the, the balancing side of it. Yeah. One thing I always like to do when I was purging a manifold is, you know, I always like to go through and, you know, I'd, I'd initially get, you know, open the, open the ball valve and get the water flowing through it. But then I would go through and I'd close all but one and just purge each loop individually right. really well. Yeah. So that, you know, I knew that I had each circuit purged out the air separate or the air vents are going to do a good job after it's in service and, and the water starts to heat up and that air starts to migrate out. But upon startup, I really like to purge each circuit individually. Sure. Well, it's tricky because you almost need two different, pumps that the pump that you'd use for normal operation uh with all zones open is not going to hit a great velocity to purge so that's why if you close it down to all but one uh you might hit a a higher you know closer to 10 feet per second that's going to help carry some of those you know those uh pockets of water all the way through where it just isn't moving fast enough to purge at um you know one foot per second through a manifold didn't take you forever to get the air out of the system. So reducing the you know the size of the orifice basically helps increase the velocity to move that through better. 
I'm glad you just touched on that because that's where I was going to head next. Oh, sorry, it's all your no, 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 man. <laughs> you you kind of read my mind a little bit. So that's another question we get. Well, how should I purge this? Do I go from the from the primary side from the boiler? Can't I just use that pump? And it's typically a homeowner or a guy that doesn't have a second pump and set of hoses in a bucket. Or should you purge through the purge valves that we put on this underneath? the air vents on the ends of these manifolds. I always recommend if you have the ability to go through the purge points, supply and return on the manifold valve off from the boiler side and, and do it that route. It's, it's going to go a lot faster to Max's point. The primary pump doesn't have enough giddy up go to purge all those loops at once. And we would still tell you purge it one loop at a time. Right. Yeah. I always used to use the purge points on the manifold to purge it. Yeah. It just works better. Sure does. Yeah, and that way you can even, you know, into a bucket or something, you can get a, a much uh, different pump that's going to hit those velocities better too and just really purge your manifold, yeah, right. you know, into a, a bucket or whatever really well. And then you can start to see when it's coming back with big, you know, chunks of air basically where it, you know, it's sputtering and then it's kind of milky and then it's nice and clear, then you're ready to move on to the next uh, yeah, drop a, of the manifold. It's a good spot to connect our hydro flush cart. Yeah, it yep. is. That thing is fantastic. It certainly is. Well, what if you were in a situation where you really didn't know maybe there was a blockage someplace? How would you find that blockage in the concrete? I think you have to beg or borrow, but not <laughs> steal uh, for an infrared camera. <laughs> right. <laughs> those things come down in price so much that that's not like a $30,000 investment anymore. You can get the you know, the little handheld ones that fit on your cell phone or something for a couple hundred bucks and it will pay for itself. If it saves you a half a day of trying to you know, scratch your head, figuring out that there's just a, a leak or a block, or you can you know walk around the house and in five minutes, get an idea for which zones are coming up to temperature and which ones are still ice cold. It just is a troubleshooting uh, tool that's well worth the investment. It sure is. I actually did a job one time with a row panel system, on, and it was a main floor. And the whole main floor of the home had a basement below it, but we did a row panel extruded aluminum floor system. And I was filling the system, and it was leaking, leaking into the basement. And now, remember, that panel is sandwiched, <laughs> sandwiched between the subfloor and the finished wood floor. Oh, no. Um, and we actually used a thermal imaging camera and went in there and I, I, I found, I could see the water start to come out of the packs and I put a, a piece of tape X over the spot and wood floor guy came in and he pulled it out and it was right there with that thermal imaging camera. That was directly yeah. over that nail. One of the things that I heard, I think it was from a, a Dan Holland article a long time ago, they used to, uh, just release a cat into the space and then they would come back later and see where the cat like laid down because they always find the warm spot um <laughs> i don't know it seems a little less scientific but maybe yeah. uh, in the early days of radiant uh that was the only way to go but yeah the thermal imaging camera is going to save you some time there <laughs> oh, Dan, yeah. and it eats less than your than your um <laughs> than your diagnostic cat that's in your van <laughs> yeah just the idea of like bossing around a cat or like locking it in a single room seems like it'd be a very long game to play. So. Right. Dan had a cat in his work truck once. Yeah, I did, but I didn't. I didn't put it there. It wasn't your cat? <laughs> it wasn't yeah. my cat. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we covered this. Yeah, I think we well. covered it pretty good. Well, yeah. Thanks again for having me, guys. And uh, if uh, if you have any other pex related topics that come in through the the phone lines or whatever, we can pick it up some other time or talk. But, you know, specifically about plumbing, if that's helpful. But again, thanks for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks for being on, Max. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for tuning in. If you ever need help, please feel free to contact our tech support team anytime at techsupport.us at com, Or call us during our business hours at 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time at 414-238-2360.